GitHub is a repository of yeah, academic computer science papers and a community viral, who loves reading them. I guess most people have been here before, so I'm not going to do any of the usual uh, explanation of what happens and how th things work. Uh, I'll go to today's papers. We have two papers, one by King Ming on analog malicious hardware and one by Ivan. I'm sorry your name goes off the screen. I think the paper's URL is too long. Uh, on fMRI interference for spatial extent, he'll explain. <laughs> so, without further ado, King Ming. Yeah, I think we turn off. Wouldn't be science, right? Wait for them first. Yeah, it's like the sign just says left, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Right. So right. Right. If you don't need the 200 meters, you're fine. Yeah, it sounded like you almost did Hey, you guys, any problem or not? Okay, you started already? Okay. Okay, so, uh, so before I begin, right, you guys remember this paper a lot. I, actually, I gave this talk uh, earlier this year uh, at Papers We Love also, so it's a reflection of trusting trust. So this paper, if you have not read, right, it's actually by Ken Thompson. So basically, he said that he gave a demo of how you can actually hack compilers to inject malicious code. The key thing here is actually in his conclusion. The first part of his conclusion, he says you can't trust code that you did not create yourself. Okay, that's one part. The second part of his conclusion, he says, we can go lower to avoid detection like assembler, loader, or hardware microcode. Which is actually quite similar to this paper, what this paper is trying to do. Okay, so now I go to the abstract. Okay, so I, I just read it out here. So this paper tries to show how a fabrication time attacker can leverage analog circuits to create hardware attacks that is small and stealthy. So it constructs a circuit that uses capacitors to siphon charge. After that, this is used to force a victim flip flop to a desired value. Then after that, you can do a remote. Uh, a remotely controllable privilege escalation using this wire to select a flip flop that holds the privilege bit. After that, they implement this attack on the OR1200 processor. So, this is the abstract. Okay, so the, the main idea here is you want to do privilege escalation with a maliciously modified hardware. Okay, so I understand that not everyone of you here is an electrical engineer or computer engineer, so I'll go through some uh, electrical concepts first. Okay, so first is the concept, the difference between an analog and a digital circuit. Okay, so for analog circuit, is this graph here. So this is actually a continuous signal. That is actually a fraction of a logic level. So if you think about a logic level somewhere here, so this signal is somewhere in between. For a digital signal, it's a discrete values. So for computers, we usually deal with binary, 0 or 1. So 1 means high logic voltage, 0 means low logic voltage. But it doesn't mean that oh, there's only 0 or 1. You can see on this graph here, you can have many discrete values in between. Okay, so then the next thing is a capacitor. Okay, so a capacitor is uh, this passive two terminal component. You just think of it as a battery, a short term battery. But the issue with a capacitor is that it can leak. That means after a while, if you don't charge it right, you, the, its voltage will drop uh, quite fast. Okay, then the next is the concept of a charge pump. Okay, so I just copied this from Wikipedia. A charge pump is a kind of DC to DC converter that uses capacitor as an energy storage to create higher or low voltage power source. So you can see what it does here. In this circuit, whenever the clock like turns on, right, the capacitor charge capacitor voltage will increase. You're actually charging the capacitor. Then when the clock goes down, right, the capacitor voltage remains constant, right? it's not being charged. So you can see every time it go every time the clock sort of engages, the voltage will go up. So it can pulse up to a level that you actually want. Okay. Then uh, next is uh, what is a flip flop? Okay. So this is a flip flop here. So it's actually a circuit that has two stable states. You can use it to store information. So, uh, so it can hold zero or one. So I've written the tr the truth table here for the S set reset or SR latch. So you can see uh, depending on what you set to R and S, right? The value Q can either remain or change or set to zero. So this is the SR latch. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Do you draw yourself to give? Uh, no, no, I copy from Keep here. <laughs> okay, no question? Okay, I go on. Okay, 
So this part is a bit more complicated. It's that of a IC integrated circuit design process. Basically, <coughs> how does a manufacturer make a chip? Uh? So actually, the concept is very similar to that of printed circuit boards. So this is a chart here that I copied from the paper. Okay, so the first part is called the digital design phase. This part here. So this is actually where they simulate out. They draw out the circuit in software. Then they simulate out with the hardware description language. So there are two types, like either VHDL or Verilog. So after that, once they design the schematic, they go on to the back-end design. So this is where they actually route out. They basically draw out the circuit pathways. Okay. So after they do it, they do something called a design rule check. So design rule check basically means that whether a manufacturer can actually make the chip that you actually draw out. Then let's say if your design passes this design rule check, then you will generate out a graphic database system or GDS2 file. So for those familiar, right, a GDS2 file is actually very similar to that of a Gerber file. So in most specific design, you design a Gerber, design a output a Gerber file, send it to the manufacturer. For a chip design, you output a GDS2 file and send it to the fabricator to make for you. Okay, then after that, you send a GDS2 file to the fabricator, to the foundry, and they'll make the chip. Then after that, uh, you just verify the chip, uh, whether it's up to your specifications or not. Okay, so this is actually the cross section of a chip. What's inside there? You can see there are many layers here. Okay, so the first part is called the front end of line. The front end of line is below uh, here. So this is where you all the transistors, capacitors, resistors, flips on all the components of a chip are right at the bottom. So in a PCB analogy, this is where the board components are. Okay, then above the FEOL, you have the back end of line or BEOL. So the BOL is all the copper wire, wires, or all the traces in PCB terms. So these traces here will detail like, how are these components being connected together. So you can see that actually uh, in this chart, there's about five layers, uh, but in modern chips, it's common like to see 10 or 13 layers already. This is quite an old chart. Then uh, right here at the top is a solder bump. This is actually where the chip is being attached to host PCB or motherboard. Okay. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> if you take a completely digitalized like a CPU, I imagine, do you still have any components in the front end of line? Or okay. At that point, is it just transistors which are not really components? But more okay. Just in the shape of the yeah, it's a shape. Like, I mean, in in this. Uh, I think components. Compo you're, you're tiny tiny transistors. transistors. Yeah. Okay. Also, you don't just have transistors. You can also have okay. like small resistors. Yeah, resistors, yeah, capacitors. Like so there wouldn't be like a physical yeah. resistor that you can solder. It will just be a feature part that's silica that's dope mm -hmm. that has uh -huh. sort of resistance. It has the property it's of. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, he's a property of the resistor and the flip flop, not the actual component. To, really. to my understanding, you get some called component library yeah. from the foundry. Yeah. yeah. So they know right. their yeah. process, yeah. and it's specific for the foundry what you can lay out. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, mostly transistors, sometimes capacitors and. and you can have capacitors so. and resistors. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Mm. Just so transistor. I mean, if there is a need for it, <laughs> yeah, there's there no need. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There is a need. Yeah, there's uh, always a need likely. for resistors okay. and capacitors. Capacitors yeah. definitely. Resistors probably. Okay. So, so for example, if you produce in DRAM process, we have a different components. Yeah. Because the capacitors will be yeah, yeah. nice, uh, very small. Okay. Can yeah, continue. Okay. So now we come to the attack components. So attack components that divided into two parts: the trigger and the payload. So a trigger is, you can think of it like somebody push a button. So in this case, the trigger monitors the wire to know when is the moment to activate the payload. So the payload is basically, basically something that is bad, like something bad that is done. Malicious action accomplished when you engage the trigger. Okay, so the, more about the target platform they chose. So this is an open RISC 1200 processor, it's open source. So they use a special instruction set, OR1K, not ARM and not x86. It's a very small instruction cache, and the thing is, this is entirely implemented in it. It's an FPGA using VHDL. I would say not very small cache because you know, the microcontrollers usually have like 16 kilobytes per cache. Oh, yeah, but yeah, I think this is a yeah, microprocessor level. So it depends on megabytes of cache. Uh, it, it has an IMU, it's more yeah. like a. Anyway. Okay, okay, never mind. <laughs> uh, I mean, the reason they chose it is because it's open source, uh, they can just make the modifications easily to this. Okay. So it's free. Yeah, open source, free open source. Okay, so uh, I'll go into a bit into the 
one of the registers they have because they use this register quite often in this attack. So the, this register is called the supervision register. I've copied out this page here from their data sheet because the paper did not do it. Okay, so the first one, uh, in this register, the first bit is to control the supervisor mode here. So you can read here, right? If it's zero, it means the current process is user mode process. If it's one, that means it can be a supervisor process, right? a root access or something like that. Okay, then in this, the 11 bit here, this is the overflow bit. So if the last aromatic operation overflows, the value will change. Uh. So if zero, it means there's no overflow in the previous operation, then if it's a, there is overflow, it will be one for this OV bit. So uh, I'll come back to I'm uh, coming back to attack model again. So I summarize the previous the abstract. So I divided this into five steps. So the first step is I will show the analog whether an analog circuit can actually use a capacitor to generate an attack. The second one is to pick a victim wire to trigger it. So the third one is when the capacitor fully charged, they deploy an attack. Here the fourth step is you stealthily implement this attack in the this processor, and finally the fifth step is what code you can run to actually activate this attack. So for step number one, so uh, we call it the single stage analog trigger. So this is based on the charge farm design. Uh. So this is the trigger input here. The trigger input can be thought of as something like a clock signal. Okay, so when you keep on triggering this, the capacitor will slowly build up its voltage. So once it cross a certain threshold, then it will trigger the output. So this is for a single stage. Okay, understand? Okay, so in the single stage design, right, the paper said that it's actually very easy to get a false positive because of this is an analog signal you may accidentally trigger when you don't want it to so that's why they suggest uh, they implemented a multi-stage trigger basically more than one triggers before they actually trigger the final trigger here okay so here they by having two you lower the probability of a false positive then you can have multiple attack vectors also instead of just going through that one particular wire Then uh, step number two is to how do you know which wire to pick up? Uh? Okay, so we use the overflow flag wire. Okay, so just now I mentioned all uh, this overflow flag, right? So they decided why not use this to wire the tr as a trigger input. Okay, so it comes here. They, they need to know what is the logical component. Yes, where it is. they need to know where this register is in the chip. And I would say that it is a constraint because even if you steal the masks, for the ECPU, it's not trivial to reverse engineer. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the entire uh, threat model of this paper is you are Intel. No, you actually, no, the, no, the, no, the threat model is that you are the foundry. Exactly, you're Intel. But even then... But okay, then Intel mean, okay, Intel is one example. Intel they control the whole thing, but certain processors, the foundry is separate sure. from the designer. Sure. No, 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 so so no, you're TSMC. You can be yeah, TSMC, yes. And then you have the GDS2 file. So you right. can... But that's the thing, right? If, if you get something which has everything placed and, and route, it, you know, it's not like you, you can easily point at a part of the chip and say, okay, this is bit six of the status register. I think with the GDS2, if, you need... If you are good, and if you have been doing it for a while, you should be able to guess, and yeah. that's what they're banking on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of guess what is right. It's like, but in this case, because they are trying to I mean, do a proof of concept... There, there, there is a guy, um, what's it, Ken Shreff, he does these things where he goes back, take old chips and like, oh, this yeah. is this part, this is that part. So I guess if you really, really we know what's going on, and I I'm also guessing it's small chips. I'm, I don't think you can do this for like a Pentium 4 or like or whatever. But actually, if you talk, when I come to the end, right, they say actually this is easier. Is it? Later at, at the end, right, I'll come to that. That's also the question. So you can certainly limit the, uh, the amount that you need to examine because you discard the whole cache, you discard the standard components. And yep. I can imagine this, they, you can just buy the rooted uh, processor like ARM, but still it would be, I mean, the logic would be. Anyway, let's, I mean, let's, if you want let's to not, attack let's not debate the, 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 the threat model system. here because that's what they claim, that's what yeah, they started okay. with. So you just see how they do it. I mean, this is how they do it. So the threat model is that the, the manufacturing, like the factory is trying to insert factory the processor that they didn't design. If someone sends yeah. to them for manufacturing, yeah. then it's a really important distinction whether they can, you know, whether they can reverse engineer it to a high enough level that they can pinpoint yeah. individual register. So it is, it's not, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not just a fully hypothetical question. Sure, it sure. goes to yeah. the heart of the threat. 
Okay, all right. Let me continue. <laughs> also, in most electronic devices, the processor will be separated by the whole chipset from from outside threat. So unless that, that is microcontroller. No, 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 no. no, no, no. no. This is the, this is the one that actually running the instruction. You just do some arithmetic. Yeah, yeah, you overflow. That's why they wire this flag here. I right, I'll wait continue first. Okay, okay. So yeah. here the overflow flag is connected to the trigger input. You imagine they trigger the overflow many times eventually, right? The output will be triggered. And this, they wire the output actually to here, to the supervisor board. Mm -hmm. Here. So eventually when it triggers, it comes here, then you flip the bit to one. So your process now has supervisor access already. Okay, so what about a uh, multi-stage trigger? So in this case, a two-stage trigger, they do it dif slightly differently. They, the, they pick the first wire to be the signed division wire, the second mm -hmm. wire to be the unsigned division wire. So uh, in this case, I couldn't find the OR1K data sheet, so I just leave it first. So assuming they wire these two wires to the trigger input, then when you trigger it enough times, you will trigger the supervisor mode bit here, output. Wait, why isn't it triggered enough times? Though? Oh, because they need to build up charge here. You just think of this as a clock. So the idea is you want to have a way for your random code that's running underprivileged to become privileged. Right. So your threat model is not just that you compromise the chip, it's that you then later deliver a payload onto said chip. You run malicious code later. Yeah, yeah and so I understand. I'm just as to why, because why they're using a charge from an analog because if you don't do that right if you don't do okay. this, uh, anyone who does a divide would see it right. Uh, right. you want it to you be would like do it enough times uh, order, right. things like that. because if you just do it once somebody accidentally trigger the thing here okay. also you probably come up with testing yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so okay what is the attack payload so uh, just like I mentioned, right, they actually attach the trigger output to the supervisor bit, so it force a, a changing of the bit. Lah. So now the user, your user mode process is given the supervisor privileges ready. So this, they actually attach some gates here. This is the SR latch that is responsible for holding the supervisor bit. Okay. Okay, so now that we know how to do it right, where do we do it? It's like this entire chain here, we can, which is the best way to put it in here? So can be done anywhere along the chain. Sorry. Basically, after after setting the supervisor mode, uh, on the next trigger again, it will be targeted. It means your current process it has the. Yeah. Yeah. As yeah that I understand. Okay. Basically, like, once it sets supervisor mode, then it is. All the way already. <laughs> yeah. So even the ca eventually the capacitor <laughs> voltage will drop. I yeah. But all the way. After some time again. No, it, it won't toggle back. No. Yeah, I'm guessing it's latches. Yeah, it lets us you maintain all the way, yeah. <laughs> Unless you downgrade yourself, <laughs> uh, which you can... <laughs> yeah, the smart thing to do is up to run in supervisor mode until you don't need it anymore. Then you downgrade. Some other root kit, yeah. then you downgrade. You can thing. downgrade yourself because uh, you are root. Okay, so okay, so now let's say, let's begin right by the first stage here. Let's say, we can we try to edit here? So this is actually the easiest way to implement because it's on the schematic level. But the thing is, this is very easily detected. I mean, you do any check, you sure can find how come got this extra circuit thing over there. And the thing is, normally at this level, right, the security of designer's machine is highest at this, at this point. Okay, so now we know this part cannot. Not only security, but you, you sometimes have the proofs, the, yeah. the test suits. Yeah, the test. Everything. The verification checks. Order. Yeah, verification checks. Easier to detect here. Okay, so now we know we cannot do it here. So Source control. Okay, so why not we do it at the back end? At this level, you can also drop some mighty block, which sometimes you don't have a... Yeah, but then then you win already. <laughs> that is like. <laughs> you an entire block, okay. Okay. So, so maybe you can't do it at the digital design phase. You do it at the back end phase. So this is definitely harder than here. But the thing is, you can actually do some simulation, and they can still detect it. Yeah. So and also the security of the design of the machine is still relatively tight. Also, so we can't do the back end. Also, so this paper says we do it at the fabrication layer. So because the security at the foundry level is relatively less compared to the earlier levels, okay? And then, but okay, the issue here is that you need also need access to GTS2 file. So you can know where to insert your malicious circuit in. So definitely is much tougher to detect than the earlier levels. Okay. Putting IP block uh, uh, might be uh, easier to detect. Uh, maybe IP block this one is the combination uh. of user space. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, but let's face it, if you, if you go down all the way to the fabrication, uh, someone putting some, you know, some extra part, etc. Like most of the time it's super tight everywhere. You can't see. Okay, so that's why I hear the stealth implementation. So, okay, so we see the CPU die size, right? It's 2.1 mm square. Mm -hmm. The analog attack, right, only occupies this space, 13.4 micrometer square. 
So it's you see they zoom in here, comes here, and they zoom in one time. So it's yeah, it's very difficult to detect this. Com compared to let's say if you do a digital base, a counter one, they actually calculated out you need ninety one gates. Uh. So it's three hundred eighty two micrometer square. So about one order of magnitude bigger. So that's why they say analog is yeah, it's much more stealthy. Okay, so now we since we see the hardware part, so how do we actually trigger this in software? So here the the pseudo I have a pseudo code I copy from the paper. So it describes how you engage a single stage trigger attack. So we do the divide by zero here. And you see this loop here, right? They do it five hundred times. Because it's unlikely anyone will divide by zero five hundred times, right? Okay. So I look at the data sheet. This is the instruction data sheet here. Okay, here, okay, here is a trigger circuit model and here is supervision register. So let's say it's divided by zero, what happens? So the data sheet says here, on divide by zero, okay, the result register will be undefined. Overflow flag will be set. Okay? Okay, so overflow flag is here. So since we wire the overflow flag to the trigger input, it comes here. So we do it 500 times, eventually the output will be triggered and then you trigger the supervisor work. <laughs> okay? Any questions? Okay. So this was single stage, but single stage may have false positive. So that's why they suggested why not do a two stage trigger attack. So they do it two ways, signed division and unsigned division. Okay. So here they say, okay, I don't have the data. They actually didn't say anything about this. So I just copy the paper here. For the two stage trigger, we select wires and report whether division was signed or signed as trigger inputs. Okay, comes here, goes to the trigger input, to the trigger output, and then you, you get the supervisor mode already like that. Okay, so what is all about the test results? Okay, it works. Uh. Okay, <laughs> the reason why I don't want to say it so much is because they dedicated, I think, four pages of, to de describe the results, which I, I'm lazy to put it in the slide. So what they basically did is that they actually varied the voltage. Because this is an analog attack, right? It's susceptible to voltage differences and temperature range. They tested from, from 0 0.8 volts to 1.2 volts and minus 25 to 100 Celsius in this chamber here. Okay, so... This is the trend. Uh. If you increase the temperature, you increase the capacitor leakage, you actually need more trigger cycles. Maybe you, you, maybe you, you need more than 500, meaning 1,000 or 2,000. Uh, sorry? So, so when you say that they, they tested it, yeah. does that mean that instead of running it on an FPGA, they actually went... They fabricated... fabricated yeah, here, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, inside awesome. this picture. Yeah, they did. Doesn't that cost a fortune? No, not for uh. I just checked. It's for, say, a Canadian researcher, it's between two and ten thousand. Really? For a million mm -hmm. for a cheap. Wait, what process? What no. Something shitty like that. Yeah, I know. No, no, no. Micrometers or one I was also I was just curious. I was I listened to a podcast recently that's also talking about if you're a researcher you get access to some uh, really cheap fabrication. Uh, it was about six thousand dollars for forty dice. Nice. Uh, on an old mode. Oh yeah. so even cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also one point. I can I can send you the the list. Apparently, it's some and national American national. Uh, uh, it used to be a part of their NASA or something like that, and it spun off, and then they they do it as a service for researchers. And the node is quite big. I believe they fabricate sixty five nanometers. It's not that's that. Actually, which that's quite good. Small. That's actually huh, right? really good. I expected yeah. that. I I okay. Remember, remember right? I need to check the paper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I need to check the paper again yeah, if I remember this value. Yeah. So they, they, they send but the circuit is not that complicated. This instruction is not that complicated. This shape. That's right. and it's not the X86. Together, it's yeah. just patching is separate. That's probably what it is. Because you need to pay for all wafer. Yep. Also, okay. for example, NUS has their own float zone uh, um, uh, process for them to make their own wafers. They mm. can do the small ones. One. Which note? Uh, I don't know which note. I don't remember. Well, I'm I'm the micro, something in the micrometers. It's not 65 nanometers. Okay. Definitely, Definitely not 65 nanometers. Probably not 65 nanometers. Huh. No, but the thing is, if you are a researcher, you probably have access to this in a university. Yeah. Yeah. But 65 nanometers. Oh, yeah. Okay, then uh, yeah, the, the another trend is that you increase the voltage, you increase the rate of capacitor accumulation, lesser cycles. So, yeah, there's some variation here. Okay. So, the, what about possible defense? How do we defend against such an attack. So maybe one way is use a side channel attack. You detect whether there's extra power consumption. But the paper said that there's a power difference of extra gate in one million gates. It's like you negligible you can't tell. Okay, so you can't use a side channel detection. Maybe you visually inspect the chip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but visual they don't of course they don't mean naked eye, right? They use probably a microscope or this. But then the thing is how you detect thirteen point four micrometer square extra circuitry in a two point one mm square. So oh, yeah. The, the issue I would have with visual inspection, I, I was actually talking and asking questions about 
electron microscopy examination, mm. what I was told that nowadays, because you have these multiple layers, uh. you don't see at all what happens yeah. in lower layers. Yeah, at all. yeah some of this gate is right at the bottom. It's actually yeah. non trivial to just disassemble. Right, you could do what the and video is and then you use an STM and drive it harder. <laughs> <laughs> because from the point of view of my electron microscope, I mean, a resolution that's trivial to. To image. Yeah, but the thing is, you need to know where you're looking for. This wasn't one. There yeah. a CCC talk no, no, about, even, about even, even though you can image, see. The, the electron yeah. microscopy basically works this way that you can have several millimeters entirely imaged several. by automated camera yeah. oh. in a vacuum. But the problem is, you need to delayer the thing yeah, because with these this heavy atoms, yeah. it will not, not ju just not. Yeah. not not transfer the, the yeah. electrons through the chip. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I remember there was a CCC talk on this and how they do this delayering yeah. and and how the chip manufacturers try to protect yeah. against delayering yeah. by doing all sorts of crazy things to allow. They put like wire mesh on top. And yeah. Something yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can pose the CCD talk okay. if anybody's interested. Okay. So okay, the another third technique is suggested split manufacturing. So you have the chip manufactured by two fabricators. So the first fa fabricator is a trusted, but this is more expensive. The second one is the untrusted of by cheaper. Okay. So the way, the first intuitive way that most people think of when it comes to split manufacturing is that okay, first I come to the goal, you obfuscate the design for the untrusted fabricator. So the trusted fabricator will do the upper layers. So here they do how is how they do it. Yeah, design house, you split your the chip design into two. Okay. So the trusted fabricator will have some of it, the, the wires. The untrusted will have the remaining, the gates and other wires. Then the untrusted one will send the unfinished chip to the fabricator, the trusted fabricator. Then you can assemble chip. Okay. So basically, I think they remove some of the top wires. Uh. The trusted fabricator will do some part of the top. The untrusted one will do below. Gates here and the other wires. But they cited a paper here that it's possible to reverse engineer 96% of the wires. I did not read this paper, uh, yeah, they just cited it. Okay, so the way they suggested their proposed way is that they split at level one. So level one here, the, the untrusted manufacturer does not make the gates. Okay, in the previous slide, the trusted manufacturer, uh, untrusted manufacturer actually can make some gates, which means they can actually add the gate in, the malicious gate in. So in this case, the trusted manufacturer will handle all the gates. So there's no way the untrusted manufacturer can insert anything malicious there. Okay, so this is a design house. Trusted manufacturer will make FEOL here plus level 1, the first copper layer. Then the untrusted manufacturer will make BEOL minus the first layer. Then you just send over and then you make the chip here. Okay? But they say that this is expensive to do it. Is it, is it not much more expensive to do it this way than? And just roll your own the whole <laughs> the manufacturer. Yeah, they roll the whole thing, but they say it's expensive to do it. So they no, they try to split it up. Uh. I mean, if the whole foundry is untrusted, then you <laughs> cannot do anything. So they, what, they, what they say is that you try to control a uh, trusted manufacturer, do a small portion here. And actually, there's no such process exists now to do this here. Yeah, how, how do you ensure the yield? You mean you shift, shift, shift here and there? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what they say. Yeah, by like a yeah. few millimeters. No, we feel micrometer done. Yeah, so that's why they say no such. <laughs> so they say it's tough to collect here. Okay, so that's why they say it's tough to actually join here. Bad news, we're off by 2.2 millimeters. That's not the whole thing. Good news, we're off by exactly 2.2 millimeters. <laughs> All that happened is you lost the ones on the edges. Of the floor, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So their proposed solution does not exist. <laughs> okay. Okay. So they here they come to the potential for x86 attacks. So actually here they say it's actually much harder to detect, but they claim it's easier to implement because x86 has small registers, and this attack only needs one. So and x86 has also more victim wise you can pick from. So you can conduct a multi-stage attack. You don't have to just pick that few wires only. Then I I just quoted this from paper. La. The only aspect of scaling to an x86 class processor that we anticipate as a challenge is maintaining controllability as there are many redundant functional wires. So a trigger would need to tap many wires. Yeah. yeah. Or we open to some probabilistic effects. Uh, okay. maybe, maybe you never know. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you mean like the management engine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a closed source thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
What's a victim? What exactly constitutes a victim? Okay. That means the why they trigger. So in just now they use the why are some are some more some can be victims some. Actually, then you can pick well, any victim wire as long as you can program it. Something like data bus is probably useless here because there's too much noise going okay. on with the other stuff. You yeah. want something right. that you can reliably trigger. Right, okay. On Intel, I, I imagine okay. the nice thing about x86 is they have a lot of weird esoteric instructions no one uses. Okay. And then you can have like the and three yeah, of this, just, three yeah, of exactly. that, like 22 but, but, of this. But, but wait, the victim wire is the one that you're targeting, right? It's yeah. not yeah. trigger, so it, like, that would be the one which... Would transfer the signal to the capacitor. Whether something is um, in, in supervisor mode. Oh, no, no, not, not no, directly. No. You're going through the capacitor. It's treated as a charge pump, the, as a clock. Right, but the victim wire is... The victim the wire is the one... When you do one divided by zero, that, that, that thing, that's the victim wire. Yeah, the victim wire will have a current going through it at and that point in time. that is connected to a capacitor, which oh, is okay, a charge pump. Victim wire is and then that, and then yeah. that it's victim fabrication time. Uh, <laughs> <this time. laughs> okay, so... Yes, uh, yes, 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 that's the correct Actually, there is here, right? Okay, so the victim wire in this case is the overflow flag here. Yeah. Okay, actually, yeah, I think that's the end of my presentation already. Yeah. Okay, that should be all. Yeah, okay. Any, any, any last questions for this? So, uh, is there actually an indication that this is happening in a while? Uh, <laughs> I don't think you will know. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think so. Uh, they microscopy people who wanted to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> Intel has its own manufacturing in house, right? Yeah. yeah so, so, so the top players, I think, they control Intel, the whole Samsung have their own. Uh, then there, there are the other foundries are like two, which is Global Foundries, TSMC. Oh, yeah. So there are only two people that would be, or two co corporations <laughs> that are able to cheat you. But it could be, it may not be the en entire corporation, but it can be somebody that's bad inside there. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's like, you know. But that could be, then that could be also inside it. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. could be, uh, could be intelligent. <laughs> 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 it's just a nice part. <laughs> well played, sir. <laughs> okay. A any more so questions? That's oh, what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. So <laughs> the attacks, how does this differ from. Existing attacks, people have proposed for fabrication time. Uh, existing attacks. How does this differ from existing fabrication time attacks? Uh, so like which attacks are you referring were, to? Were, 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 I think, digital ones mm. or oh. attempting to just add the copper wire in one of the layers. So if Hopefully, the bottom most layer so that you cannot detect. Just add a wire to do an attack. Yes. But that sounds like that <laughs> you add, if you just add a copper wire, that means you need to you be directly yeah, attached yeah, over. Then it's very easy to trigger false yeah, positive yeah. and to detect this. So here it's very hard to detect because that there, there is. And the existing attacks are digital attacks, mm -hmm. so you need a larger space to do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Any more? Okay. Uh, again, right. that's all. Next break. Or oh, do you guys want a five minutes break? Maybe fire break. Okay. Did you say fire break? <laughs> Fire break. Fire break. Fire break. Fire break. Fire break. Fire break. Also, yeah.